Uh, so a lot has changed in terms of national events for the past year. Um, but obviously we're aware people might be wanting to run a rally, a ball or anything like that sort of when that becomes possible again. And we thought we'd put this session together to sort of try and share some of our committee's experiences in running um, both in-person events. Um, and we're also gonna talk about some online events um, and really a little bit of everything. Um, so if you've got any questions about um, various things, we wanna try and make it as you know, interactive as possible. Um, and I am now going to attempt to share a PowerPoint. Um, so, this is a very defaultly looking PowerPoint because um, I've, we've also been busy trying to sort of make the event and didn't want to put too much time into making a fancy PowerPoint. It'll look nicer some point in the future. Um, so I guess our first question is, what sort of um, events are people interested in? Um, I can know some people here are involved with events. Um, but yeah, if there's anything in particular you want us to mention in more details, um, or you're thinking about bidding for an event, then it's a good time to let us know. Um, Do feel free to um, pipe in at any time if you have a question as well. Um, so yeah, um, we're going to essentially uh, cover this. So as a sort of introduction to us, um, I was the chair of Cambridge Duck Rally in 2018 uh, and the chair of this rally in 2021. Um, they've both been relatively different. Um, and also Ant is the um, national events assistant um, and was catering for this rally. So I hope you all agree the food this weekend has been great. Um, um, and I was also involved with Great 48, which was cancelled um, and was sort of a larger Sega event that was optimistically planned. Um, so we're going to sort of use examples from those in all these kind of slides. Um, so each year Sega has several different kinds of events. So the national events mainly are three rallies and a ball. Um, regions sort of tend to host their own freshers camps, but there's no constraints on sort of, you know, that regions are free to organize their own camps. Um, this past year, we've seen more and more virtual events for obvious reasons, um, but obviously there's no reason for those to stop in the coming sort of years. Um, the sort of common special events are Witten and Reunion, which are sort of the international trip and sort of the gathering for past graduates. However, there is, when there are event bids, the option to bid for anything else. If you have some kind of event you'd like sort of national to be involved with, then you are free to just submit a bid for it and say your members can approve if this is something that they want to run. Um, and so vaguely about these events, uh, the three rallies are in spring, sort of summer, late June, autumn, November. Um, spring rallies tend to be the biggest, um, although, you know, COVID may change that over the short term um, and sort of have maybe around 300 people. Um, summer rallies tend to be the smallest um, just because people have gone back from university often by the point they start. So for a normal rally, people can minibus and sort of carpool in their clubs, which is much harder for summer rallies. And there's a £27 fixed cost that you have to bring your event in at. Um, balls are held in April and sort of have 120 to 160 people. However, um, it's pretty random how many people you get. Um, so a lot of that depends on the total price, because if you look at sort of balls like ABBA does ABBA, which was in Aberystwyth. Um, while it was an absolute pain for everyone to get to, um, lots of people went because um, it cost £37.50 for the weekend, including your ball ticket and a weekend's accommodation. Whereas if you look at some sort of like some other balls, steel ball was going to cost like £50. 
So like that sort of £13 saving gets you a lot further on the train. Um, when bidding for a ball, your sort of advice is uh, to tell people how much it's going to cost um, and sort of tell them a bit more about where they might be staying. Um, if you're bidding for a special event, no one really knows what this event is. Um, you know, you can say, oh, I'm bidding for a whistle. Um, you need to tell people when, where, why, um, and all the kind of extra information in this event. And that is all really up to you to design. Um, so before you bid, um, there's several things you sort of need to know about events. Um, so all Sago events have a theme. Um, this can be like pretty simple or really complicated. It's totally up to you. Um, we've got some ideas for themes on um, maybe the next slide, maybe not. Um, a future slide has some ideas about themes. You also need essentially some kind of committee in place. Um, so the minimum committee you need is a chair, a treasurer and a secretary. However, when really bidding, you should be confident that you can find a lot more committee than that to help you. Like if you try and run an event like this as a three person group, um, you won't have a life. Um, it'll sort of take quite a lot of time. Um, and you sort of also need to tell people the location. Um, and then everything else is sort of the character to your bid. Um, people sort of want to see that you've planned out what's happening. Um, and coming up to them with just a theme, three people in a location, uh, won't do that. Um, I guess sort of over the last year, we've learned that Zoom is um, everything. Um, so there's sort of no reason why you have to be in the same location as all your committee. Um, we've not had a in-person Green Rally, Yellow Rally meeting at all. Um, I mean, we have all met before, um, but we've not since winning. Um, ever been in the same room. Um, and it doesn't even have to be a location close to you. Um, I live 350 miles from Milton Keynes. Um, so it's not a particularly close campsite for me. Um, you can also balance your committee between sort of current members and also associates um, because it's sort of useful when you go into exam period and all your students decide that they've got exams and that exams are more important than SAGO and you persuade them that they're wrong, um, that SEGO is life and exams aren't. Um, so sort of having sort of graduates that don't have exams and can sort of bunk off their jobs for a bit and sort of support you in that time is also really useful. Um, so yeah, and for the special events, you need the sort of the price, the accommodation options and when it'll be. Um, so, we're going to sort of look at maybe a typical rally program. Um, so in essence, this is totally up to you to design. Um, there's lots of options. The sort of Friday and Sunday, which I've put on this slide sort of on purpose, and I've not forgot about Saturday, um, tend to be a lot more fixed um, just because of how people get to rally. Um, often clubs won't leave until sort of 6 p.m. after they finish their lectures, um, which means that if you're from a far away club, um, you won't arrive until midnight or 2 a.m. or 6 a.m. or some god awful time sort of late at rally. So um, your options on Friday are a bit limited. You sort of have to have a dinner that goes on and on and on. Um, and then there's normally evening activities and campfires. Um, and very much the same on Sunday, um, people tend to leave very early if they have to do this nine hour drive back to where they came from. Um, you sort of always also have the AGM if you're bidding for a spring rally. Um, so this program comes from 90s rally, which uh, was one of my favorites. Um, and this kind of format has been used for um, at most national events since. Um, so I think every event from uh, Lancaster Fant Fantasy Rally in November 2018 has used basically the same program as this. Um, so this is the Saturday. Um, people get up really early for breakfast. Um, 
there tends to be some kind of staff briefing. Um, and then oh, there's a nice typo. There's an extra capital letter. Um, you have your opening ceremony. Sorry. I don't think Marcelli agrees with your definition of very early. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Uh, this made me very dependent. It feels very early for me. Um, um, it well, probably feels very student, early for those perhaps, people that yeah. arrive at like 6am. <laughs> but yeah, Saturday tends to be sort of a more packed day because that's your chance to show them your location and essentially take them around your city, I guess, or wherever you're hosting it. Um, so it tends to have some kind of um, opening ceremony. Then you cram people onto coaches. Um, they take you into some location. Um, and then for this rally, there were no morning activities because these were quite long coaches. Um, Chocolate Rally had a very similar format because they didn't go as far. And they also forced people onto coaches, I think slightly earlier than 9 a.m. Um, there was a kind of morning monopoly run um, that slots in before this. Um, and then you sort of, at 5 p.m., force everyone back onto the coaches and back home. Um, evening, nearly every rally has a Kaylee. Um, that's essentially a sort of done thing. There's also the um, disco and sort of the optional disco. Some rallies have that, some have both, some have one or the other. And you can also put on your own evening activities. Lots of more recent rallies are expanding sort of what they're doing there. I know there's been a night hike at quite a few past rallies, which lots of people have sort of enjoyed. Um, so there's lots of sort of options to expand. Um, so that isn't the only options. Um, you are free to just do as you please, really, with these. Uh, so the one on the left is from Witten and a Weekend Rally. Um, so they made use of the fact that they were in London and had some great transport links um, because the campsite was on the tube. Um, so instead of having any coaches, um, after the opening ceremony, people grouped up into sort of a morning activity group. They all got on the tube in their little morning activity group and went and did something in London. Um, and then after that finished, they got a tube to Russell Square um, where everyone met back up, had lunch, and then they reorganized themselves into afternoon activity groups, got on another tube, went to their afternoon activity, got on a tube, and sort of came back to the site themselves after their activities on the tube. Um, so obviously, I guess that setup is quite London specific, but if you have very good public transport, you know, you can sort of take options of using it to sort of get people to and from site. Um, for instance, um, I think Dino Rally put people on the train for some activities just because it's cheaper and if you're only send, you don't know how many people you're sending, you can just buy train tickets once people have booked and send them on trains. And then if they miss the train, it's their own fault instead of holding everyone up for a coach. Um, the program on the right is from Duck Rally. Um, so that gives a sort of a different option for those that maybe don't have a campsite that could host a Kaylee. Um, so our campsite wasn't very flat, um, which isn't ideal for drunk people dancing. Um, and it wasn't ideal for putting a marquee on because it's not very flat and it wouldn't fit anywhere. Um, so what we did instead was sort of after our afternoon activities finished, we transported dinner into the um, center of Cambridge and we served dinner at a scout hut which had a big hall and we had the Cayley um, in there um, so that's sort of a different option and obviously most local scout halls are pretty cheap to hire so it sort of can be an alternative to having a marquee and sort of a big Cayley venue um, obviously the concerns are you do have to move your dinner from the place that you're cooking it to where the Kaylee is, um, or you have to find somewhere that you can cook dinner in where your Kaylee is going to be, um, and there's sort of issues with that. Um, I guess, are there any questions? I'm just talking on. Um, so, and then this was the um, 
I guess another different. Well, so this was the um, program we were going for for Green Rally, Yellow Rally in person. Um, so again, this was I guess slightly different to sort of lots of the past ones, in the sense that um, breakfast was going to run slightly later. Um, because we were planning to keep lots of people on site for the morning and sort of have a more relaxed drop-in morning um, where people could do things on site across various like zones. Um, and then there'd be the scope to sort of take them to places close to the campsite in a minibus to sort of see like a Northampton Museum. Um, and then sort of dinner would start a bit later and there'd be a longer slot for sort of the afternoon activities. Um, but yeah, you sort of have a wide range of scope to personalize these to however your event wants to really work. Uh, so themes. Um, so essentially anything goes really, well, maybe not anything, but most things go in terms of Sego themes. Um, you might want to pick something sort of themed locally. Um, so I've given you some examples from the website um, which you might recognize. Um, so essentially picking a theme that's sort of local to you is, I guess, you know, quite a easy way to incorporate activities. Um, you've got lots of options nearby um, and things like that you can sort of really incorporate. So some of the biggest rally activities ever um, are the uh, trip to the Space Museum at Space Rally and the trip to the... Um, Cadbury World at Chocolate Rally. Um, so you can sort of see how a theme can tie into sort of a really big activity you want to offer. Um, oh, there's questions in the chat. Sorry, Nicole. Um, I, I can keep an eye on those. Um, um, okay, I will answer Nicole's question now um, because I didn't have the chat open. Um, I guess a key part of like a good bid is um, um, essentially linking everything together. Like you sort of want to, I always feel like bids that seem most organized always do very well. Um, if you've got a solid plan, you can tell people what activities that you're going to sort of headline with and how they link to your theme. And, uh, you know, a lot of the time there's going to be lots of activities people know you're going to do. Like everyone knows there's probably going to be a hike. Um, but you want to tell them maybe the random activities you're thinking of that tie into your theme um, that sort of make it a really personal thing that they can emphasize with, I guess. Um, I mean, I, I feel like advertising things about food as well. I mean, I quite like food. So like if you told me about your food, um, that's definitely something that would interest me. Um, but yeah, sort of a sort of planned out bid, maybe some thought about what you're going to do, what you're going to eat, how it's all going to link together. Um, I think is really the key to a sort of good bid. Um, so yeah, you've got all these themes. You can go for quite a sort of, I, I've called these themes generic. Um, and I know sort of two of these come from themes that our committee have organized. Um, but sort of picking a very sort of, generic item gives you lots of scope to sort of host an event really anywhere and also incorporate lots of thematic elements. Um, you can also go for sort of like a cultural reference, um, things like that also give you lots of, you know, things to sort of play off in your activities. Um, again, sort of throwback themes are very popular. Um, you can go punny. Um, I think bath time is my favorite recent sort of like uh, one on that kind. But again, you sort of have to maybe explain how you're going to link the theme to um, what you're actually going to do in terms of the rally. Um, so yeah, um, on the next slide, um, I've got some examples. Um, the next slide. Uh, so this comes from some of the plans for Great 48. So when sort of this was being designed, there was no particular um i say like yeah no particular like theming apart from the fact that this was just going to be a 48 hour event for sort of sago network and inspire members um and it was going to take place uh from the 5th to the 7th of march 2021 
um, coincidentally. Um, but essentially, with that wide scope of things, it's very hard to sort of determine what you actually want to offer as activities, um, especially to people that maybe have, you know, the they've done lots of scouting and guiding before. Uh, so we went for a sort of Sega inspired giving each zone sort of time-based themes and then putting various activities in there. And essentially the advantage of this is you can offer lots of random activities like um, Takeshi's Castle Challenges would involve just lots of wood and running into things and like eating food out of bags hanging from trees. Like it's a, quite a cheap thing to run, but if people sort of um, engage with the theme, they engage with these random activities that you can put on really cheaply, um, which is a great way to sort of incorporate the theme and also not spend money. Um, so in terms of a organizing these kinds of things, oh, uh, I missed a bit on theme. So in terms of online themes, um, you might find essentially picking quite a broad theme um, to be a lot more useful than picking something specific or local. Um, I know one thing that we've struggled with was trying to incorporate lots of our sort of competition-based ideas online in a way that was really possible in us like allocating lots of points and doing all that. And that's sort of why we've added elements to our program themed around sort of things that we might have visited at Rally, um, even though we can't visit them. Um, we sort of included those to sort of give, give some different options. Um, so yeah, in terms of a committee, there's only three compulsory roles, um, but you will essentially die if you try and organize all these other bits just as three essential roles. Um, so basically essential is having at least one person to coordinate your activities. Like they're a huge part of rally. Um, someone to cook all the food is also useful because people like being fed. Um, you can sort of do this all as staff if you really wanted and like have all your chair plan the menu, but it just won't work as well as having someone in the kitchen all weekend or like part of the weekend who sort of planned the menu that they like and is comfortable cooking it. Um, in person, someone who's sorting logistics is also really useful. Like rallies often run late. There's all kinds of coaches, minibuses, lots of different shuttles to various activities. Um, having someone who's sort of in the know about when the next group is going to be picked up from the train station, you know, when all these things are happening and coordinating that is another big job. Um, it's actually very useful our publicity. Um, you know, it takes a lot of effort to post lots of content, sort of engaging people on Facebook, Instagram, all that kind of stuff. It takes time and um, looking at sort of um, various past events. Um, so if you look at, say, Chocolate Rally, which did lots of publicity in advance, um, that was a huge event. Um, and possibly because of essentially the publicity they've done, they'd reached lots of new people who sort of haven't been to a rally before and decided that they'd come to Chocolate Rally. Um, extra activities people are always very useful. Like there's often about 20 something activities happening in an afternoon. Having two people you can go to to talk about those is better than one. Um, you can sort of split it up in lots of ways. Um, so we had originally split it up so that Harriet and Samir would organize sort of half of all the activities in each slot. Um, and then um, essentially at every slot, one of them would be available for, they'd both be organizing something so they'd be able, be able to be in separate places and coordinating different things. Um, extra catering is also really useful, like having two people to head that up because you have to get I, up at sort of like- I know, can't five. stress that enough. I yeah. honestly cannot stress that enough. Um, with catering, you cannot have enough staff at all. It doesn't necessarily have to be strictly to people in the kitchen. It could just be making, you know, making sandwiches and that's all they do for the weekend uh, and um, serving as well, uh, running, washing up water, just general like little jobs that they don't even have to do for the whole weekend. Um, things like if you have a, a massive role, 
through the build-up of rally. But so, for example, the secretary doesn't really have that much of a role physically as a secretary at rally, so they can just jump in wherever they're needed. They're usually an odd bod as such, and so the catering team will always want to grab them. Uh, and yeah, the treasurer, the catering member, and the logistics member uh, all need to get on reasonably well because they're going to be working so closely together um, as, yeah, you just, you just need to get on or at least see eye to eye because otherwise it could cause issues with uh, down the line as you're getting close to rally, the caterer, you know, wanting money to pay for food, but they're not allowed to have the food unless the treasurer goes shopping can cause heated issues. Um, <laughs> but yeah, as I say, the treasurer, the catering and logistics officer, they work really closely together. And yeah, as hopefully they can work well when a physical rally returns. Um, so yeah, um, multiple people are like for catering is really useful because someone gets up at 5 a.m. to cook breakfast. They don't want to stay up until 11 p.m. until they finish oh, cooking yeah. dinner oh, and then sort of go to back for six hours sleep because by Sunday they'll be a really angry chef and just not in a good mood. So like if you've got people that can split it up, one takes breakfast, one takes other meals, um, there's lots of sort of ways to do that. Um, some rallies have someone in charge of first aid. Um, so whatever event happens, you need to have first aid cover. Um, like, so for duck rally and for this rally, we'd have probably just managed that with someone else on the committee, would have just overseen there were first aiders. Um, but some of the rallies have either dedicated first aid staff, uh, sort of like a committee member who's doing first aid all weekend, um, or various different ways like that. Um, so... Some rallies, you will have to hire lots of stuff in. Um, often that falls into the logistics role. Um, but if you're hiring an awful lot of stuff, um, you could find having sort of like a separate role that manages all the hiring stuff and leaves logistics to sorting out coaches and moving people around. Um, that's sort of an option. Um, again, sort of welfare. Um, there have been issues in the past about rallies being accessible and there have been complaints um, and it is something that rallies have improved a lot on over sort of my time in Sago. Um, I remember when rallies wouldn't have any indoor accommodation. Um, there'd be food that was only served upstairs. Um, and essentially, you know, people didn't really put as much thought into um, the accessibility and sort of making sure that people are OK at rallies. Um, and that has improved a lot. And sort of having a dedicated person to think about those issues um, can be really useful. Um, I'd also say extra publicity is, you know, um, I find posting on social media every day quite draining. Um, you know, I enjoy it, but I, um, I'm ready to take a long break. Um, but finding more people to do publicity sort of really help because it does really get you out there. And I think for an online event, especially, um, the publicity is sort of your main way of attracting people. Like, um, you know, if you're a free event, you've got to sort of get to people, convince them to book so that you can send them the information and sort of sell it to them then. Um, for a virtual event, um, postage, um, that's sort of taken a lot of our time over the past sort of week, um, was just one person just packaging. Um, I think it was about 600 parcels because badges have gone separately. Um, having a sort of dedicated person to do that. I mean, hopefully in future, people are able to get together and do it as a group. Um, but I guess if you're organising a virtual event with people from across the UK, that might not be possible um, still. Um, and again, even more publicity and activities, like um, we've been running these activities sort of all weekend and sort of dropping between them. Um, but having more people means that you can take more breaks um, and sort of, I guess, have a lot more sort of going on. Um, like having people that are good at editing videos and sort of doing things like that can also be great for online stuff if that's how you want to publicize yourself. And you may also want someone who's really good at websites. Um, the Sega website is interesting to use, um, but people who are good at websites should be able to do quite a lot with it. Um, so having someone that's dedicated to you um, and can do all the stuff that you want 
is really quite useful. Um, oh, um, in terms of staff roles, um, in person you need drivers. Um, we'd recommend that you don't use committee as drivers. Like it's essentially a recipe for disaster because they're already stressed with organizing an event. Can um, I put in there, Tom? Um, so this is like the perfect place to put your associates if you're a club. Uh, utilize your freshers as well. They want to get involved. They really want to get involved. Um, and they want to be part of the team. So yeah, utilize your freshers. Utilize your uh, associates. Because uh, associates, they just want to cling on. They do want to cling on, believe it or not. Um, so, so let them drive your minibuses. They want to stay around. Let them. Um, yeah, and the, also another good source is like local scouting. If you've got leaders that you're like, you know, got good links with as a group, like most of them, you know, they're willing to give up an odd weekend for um, scouting and, you know, you can bring them, um, you know, in the past events have given away, you know, various gifts, you know, if you drive this minibus all weekend on Sunday, you can have a crate of beer, um, works wonders. Um, and sort of it does, you know, free up people to drive um, and they're sort of, I guess, safe. Um, you know, the last thing you want is someone stressed driving that you're late and trying to get you through your activity on time because they're on committee and don't want to run late. Um, you need first aid cover um, and things like pot washers, chefs. This takes ages. Um, in terms of, you know, what jobs you allocate, um, I mean, I know one thing that sort of happened at Duck Rally that I'm sort of a bit disappointed about was we ended up having to use people who'd sort of only been to one rally um, and sort of they had to do bits of pot washing, they had to do bits of cooking. Um, and obviously, like, I guess as a first event, that's maybe not what you want to be doing in Sago um, is cooking for lots of people you've never met. Um, but there are lots of great ways to use freshers, you know, if they're leading an activity. Um, hopefully you avoid the issues where you just get someone random to lead the activity and they get everyone lost because they don't know where they are and they've never been to your city before. Um, hopefully your freshers won't get them as lost because they've lived there for a few months. Um, you know, there's lots of sort of general tasks that always need to be done. And a concept that we quite liked was the heroes at Chocolate Rally, where they sort of had people in each club to sort of deal with you know, sort of minor incidents like people that were far too drunk. Um, because, you know, if you've been up all night and you're waiting to do first aid or deal with various things, um, drunk people can be annoying and it's good to have someone to pass them off to. Um, so we're now going to look at sites. Um, so a good site can really make an event. Um, so there are lots of issues. Some sites don't really want a group of 300 students to come to them. Um, they think that this is quite risky. Um, we might destroy the site. We might leave alcohol everywhere and they're just gonna have to clean it up um, after we've gone. Um, Sago has you know, a good reputation at the sites. Most of the sites it's been at. Um, most rallies sites are happy to give references for Sago because they have, you know, enjoyed having Sago there. Um, but, you know, some sites will just be put off. Um, we definitely recommend visiting quite a few options because you never know what might happen. And, you know, if you're visiting a viewing site online, it could be very different in person when you go and visit it. Um, so these are, this is a map showing sort of the visits that we did for Green Rally, Yellow Rally. Um, so we visited all the sites that are either crosses um, or not grey squares. Um, so yeah, we visited everything that's not a grey square. Um, we we can. It's also worth saying we considered all of these central sites as well. Yeah. Um, so what we sort of did was we viewed sites closest to Milton Keynes, and then we sort of kept expanding outwards until we found a site we liked. And these grey squares were sort of our next layer of expansion, I guess. In that, if we didn't like any sites so far those five are going to be the next five sites that we viewed um, as a potential place to hold a rally. Um, so yeah, like, I guess as well, we found sites that for spring rally were concerned, we'd just churn up hundred, loads and loads of mud, um, which if you sort of saw Roman rally um, is definitely something that happens. 
um, and it would sort of ruin the rest of their um, season. Um, and also, we sort of like we were planning to sort of host it at the one of the crosses really close to Milton Keynes, um, but with the uncertainty about COVID and the sort of potential that we might have to socially distance people if it could go ahead in person, uh, we thought the best thing to do was go for a site which was a lot bigger and a lot cheaper um, because more space for social distancing and less financial sort of commitments in case um, things sort of couldn't happen and we had to cancel it. Um, and essentially making lots of notes because it's unlikely everyone on your committee can visit. Um, only me and Ant visited all these sites. Um, and then we just made note and compared and sort of had a little vote on which was best in various categories. Um, you nearly always need an exclusive use of the site just because if you imagine there's a group of beavers on the site and then there's 300 members of Sago, um, some of whom will be getting drunk. It's just a giant safeguarding issue um, that you sort of need to deal with. And the best way is not having the group of beavers um, or sort of any other groups of under 18s. It's also worth noting uh, sites that have been used before. So currently, uh, myself and I believe Ollie and a few other people, we've been working on a campsite directory that Sago has used based upon the UK Scouts campsite directory. So campsites that have been used before, and I'm currently working on campsites that have been considered but not used before for the other reason of why they haven't been used. Um, so as I've said, some of these we've all considered. And the reason why that, for example, our Bedford one would have been absolutely perfect for us. It would have been completely perfect to use for us. The only issue with was it's so expensive to be there. Um, we wouldn't have needed to have a marquee. However, we would have had to split the AGM into two separate halls, which would have been a bit controversial uh, unless we had the marquee. But because of the price, we wouldn't have been able to afford the marquee. Um, but it was such a perfect site for us. Um, I was really looking forward to using a quad bike between going between two kitchens. Um, yeah. They had three quad bikes which were included in the price of the campsite. So like we could have just ridden about as committee on quad bikes for a weekend. Um, but that campsite was, I think, only slightly cheaper than the, what Witten paid for Candestoke. Um, so it was a very pricey campsite and sort of like a lot of financial risk in terms of the pandemic. Um, you sort of have lots of questions. So one of the things that's hopefully gonna come out of our rally is lots of resources. Um, so we have like an A, two A4 sides of like questions that we asked that every campsite made notes at and ranked and compared them at. Um, so things like making notes of how many kitchens there are, how many ovens, how many gas hobs, how many fridges, freezers, you know, what kind of space there was, if we had to bring our own pots and pans, um, all kinds of serving areas, warming areas, how far we'd have to carry food from the kitchen to the marquee where we serve it. Um, some sites you need to hire a skip in because they don't really have enough bins to sort of cope with a Sago event. Um, you might want to think about what phone signal there is because that can also cause massive problems if you can't call people in an emergency. Um, you know, you might want to ask general questions about how big a camp they've held at their site before. Um, because if you're planning to host one, which is significantly bigger, um, this could be just a major problem in terms of, you know, working with them. Um, so like Duck Rally was the biggest camp that's been held at the Jarman Centre. Um, and they didn't even believe that we fit on the site. Um, but they were sort of willing to work with us to try and squeeze it on. And we actually fitted with two fields to spare um, because Sago camps really close. Um, yep, yeah, um, these slides will be available afterwards. Um, they'll go onto the resources, event resources drive and hopefully be with some company information. Um, but yeah, sort of working with them, um, Sago does camp quite weirdly and does work on lots of sites because the central catering mm -hmm. and how close people camp and sort of the club tents, it does tend to sort of work on a smaller and a bit weirder sites. Um, 
And going for the best site obviously isn't always the best option. Like we went for the site we thought was second best in every single regard apart from cost. Um, but, you know, if it was best in cost, second best in everything else, um, that's definitely a good option versus best and then just worse in cost um, because the site that was better was £5,000 more expensive, which is a lot of money. Um, so... There's four main criteria we've got for sort of the <laughs> catering. Um, so I think Anne wants to read these out. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the, the main things about food is Sago don't really mind about the quality of food that much. They just want a lot of food uh, for very little value. Um, so it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be good quantity, good quality, sorry, but it does have to be in good quantities and it does have to be hot. Oh, did I mention that the food has to be hot? Um, so, um, yes. Lots of cheap things that you can do to improve. And we like the word cheap in Sago. Uh, lots of things that you can improve to uh, make catering a lot easier, a lot quicker, is buy pre-chopped veg. Because it's such a mass catering event, uh, going to Booker's, Costco is not a far-fetched idea, if there is one nearby. Buying pre-chopped veg, yes, it may be a little bit 10% more expensive, uh, or up to 10% more expensive to buy in these pre-chopped veg. Sometimes um, they will be worth your time, uh, in the sense of your time, if you're a chef, is worth about £9 an hour, if we're going to go with minimum wage and living wage. So your, your time as a chef is worth nine pounds an hour. If you're wasting more than nine pounds, you know, you can't save nine pounds in pre-chopped veg and you're taking over an hour to chop veg. Is that really worth your time? Um, you know, I'd, I'd spend an extra nine pounds uh, for my rally to get an extra hour of sleep, <laughs> for example. Uh, so yeah, hiring extra equipment or uh, scouts, Scout huts in general, they can have a lot of catering equipment, chafing dishes, for example, so chafing fuel to keep your food warm, warming trays, warming cabinets, things like that. Sites even may have these. Um, if you've got a long distance to take your food from the kitchens to, say, your marquee where your main eating space is, maybe having uh, an electric trolley or um, some form of small vehicle like a golf cart that can take uh, the food over quickly um, or just have like a clear path where you've got this clear gangway that you set up uh, straight away that no one else can touch, like as an emergency lane, if you will, through the camp so you can get your food straight over. Have a tent behind the marquee, very similar to what Bath Rally did, uh, Roman Rally did, so that where they have uh, food uh, warming up, re preheated, ready to go in the serving tent. There's a... So many different things that you can do, and also washing up water. So little things like washing up water. Um, you know, the, the slosh and wash uh, scheme that Birmingham really introduced, Chocolate really introduced. I was really impressed with that, and actually, it's so easy to incorporate at other events, and it's so successful as well. Uh, people are happy because they get to wash up in clean, warm, washing up water. It makes such a difference, and. Um, you know, lots of tea, lots of coffee needs to be on offer. Um, and yeah, if you have a bar, uh, a temp am, am I jumping the gun here, Tom, with a bar? I, I think possibly, yeah. Yeah, okay, um, I'll will, I will, I will let you okay. jump back in there. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I guess as well, some things that other rallies have done is make food in advance. Um, so uh, we did this for Duck Rally and we cooked some food on Thursday before rally started. Uh, and then we just put it in the fridge or the freezer um, and then essentially sort of reheated it and sort of added various fresh things to it like that, just to try and sort of save time over the weekend. Um, like you'll have a limited number of staff that are willing to help. And over the weekend, you have to prioritize what you want them to do. And, you know, if you can take some people off cooking for a few hours, that's more people you could have doing something else, um, which, you know, other people could enjoy. Um, Food is always sort of going to be difficult. Um, it's sort of very rare that you'll find someone in your club 
who's got experience of cooking for 300 people. Um, it's not a sort of skill that you just have. Um, it's a skill that you have from sort of probably running a rally before um, and being in the kitchen. Um, but, you know, you will probably be able to find sort of other people in Sago or like local leaders who might be willing to sort of support, you know, that experience because cooking for 300 is very difficult to maybe like cooking for 30 people, come for a party or cooking for five. It you know, can also be a like very a daunting experience. If you make yeah. a slight mistake, it can be a very daunting experience. And for people like myself, I can be very harsh, but at the same time, I can be very understanding if people make a mistake. I'm also one of these people that will be, yeah, you made a mistake, great, let's move on. We've got a lot of work to do. Um, so I won't let you dwell on it. Uh, just quite try and distract you. Like, yeah, we've still got work to do. Uh, I'm always happy to help with any catering side or any staffing events, you know, national events, so it should be quite standard that I'll say, I'll, I'm happy to staff some events for you. Um, but if you want to shove me in a kitchen, sounds great. Um, yeah, and you might want to think about things like if you've got staff with food hygiene certificates, stuff like that, uh, one of those sort of help. Um, one thing that we also did for Dr. Rally was cook our entire menu for like the club um, a few weeks before rally as like a test run. So like, even though you're only cooking it for 30, um, you get the chance for people to sort of review it and make any changes um, because you can do lots of the catering sort of last, like the planning for it can be quite a last minute role. Um, mm. In terms of dietary requirements that you need to cater for at Rally, we've compiled some stats based on all the bookings for Green Rally, Yellow Rally. Um, so one in six people who've booked for Green Rally, Yellow Rally are vegetarian. Um, one in 30 are vegan. Um, about one in 15 have a dairy or lactose allergy. Um, one, in 30, one in 30 can't have any nuts. Um, so that's sort of like a snapshot of the wide range of requirements within Sago. Uh, and this world has essentially everything that was listed in people's dietary requirements. Um, I'm particularly fond of Sorry, which appeared quite a few times. Um, um, but there's also essentially nearly every single um, fruit and or vegetable appears somewhere, sprouts, baked beans, mushy peas are somewhere. Um, one person said they just don't like beige. Um, there's, yeah, all kinds of um, things. There's also several important ones that sort of, uh, even though very few people have, um, there are people who will book that may have a kind of medically specified diet you have to cater for. Uh, so for this rally, uh, we would have had to have a high fat diet, a low carb diet, and a ketogenic diet, um, which were medically specified. Um, I don't know if because we were online, um, there was maybe some sort of like people that maybe wouldn't have normally sort of asked for food at a rally or gone to a rally because of these reasons. Um, but this is, I'd say this is probably like one of the worst I've seen in terms of the medical diets having three different ones, which are not totally compatible. Um, but there are quite a lot of things and you also want to consider um, the flavours that people may complain about while some people did say they really some people put no spice as a dietary requirement there are probably quite a lot more who would really complain if you serve them like a vindaloo strength curry um, it's a lot easier to sort of make food spicier uh, than it is to take it out with things that you add um, so that's a thing to bear in mind with sort of menu. And it's also, before we move on to activities, food is such an important part of your rally. People will remember your food. Um, you can make your food as good as it can be uh, or as bad as it can be, and people will remember that. Um, you know, you remember rallies for how good their food was. I can't stress that enough. If your food's not good, you uh, struggle to leave a good impression on on the rest of your rally. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think like I said, like one of my favorites was 90s rally. And like one of my main memories of 90s rally was the roast dinner that they served on Saturday. Yeah. Um, and like, it sort of sticks with you. And one thing that lots of people tell me about duck rally was that they liked the fajitas on Sunday. Um, and it's like, well, that sort of, it just seems to be something that sticks with people. Um, so in terms of like activities, 
Um, again, you've got an awful lot of um, various choices. So these are, this is a word cloud from the in-person green rally, yellow rally activities. Um, so you can sort of see that there was a key theme of lots of them go to Bletchley. Um, but essentially, lots of this is providing a various variety of things for people to do. Um, one thing to avoid is probably offering very classic scout and guide activities, things like archery, air rifles, all those kind of things that you do on site. Um, lots of people have done them before and they don't really want to travel to a rally to sort of do that in an afternoon. Um, lot, most activities that people pick are getting them into the city and doing something um, to do with the area or the theme. Um, you know, they can be things like visiting like an escape room, which I guess is not that area specific, but it's sort of more a, um, you know, thing, um, sort of an attraction nearby that they couldn't do at home. Thank you, Samir. Um, um, but yeah, you want to cover like a wide range of activities. Um, and I don't have the exact stats in this uh, presentation, but there is a breakdown available of like how many sort of people typically do various categories of activities at rallies. Um, and, you know, there's lots of scope to sort of do things that haven't been done that often, like one that always seems to be quite popular, but never really offered is water activities. Um, you know, uh, I guess it's a bit more fun than sort of the archery and air rifles, but because you can see people in Sego just being dumped into water. Um, but, you know, things like that sort of only get done occasionally. And when they do get done, they are really popular. Um, so in terms of like weird activities that tend to happen at rallies, uh, there tends to be a long hike at nearly every rally, um, which gets treated fairly differently because they often leave very early and return to site a bit later than everyone else. Um, because these people want to sort of hike a long distance in a new location. Um, and there is often a range of ability levels on these kind of things. Um, some people will quite happily hike. Uh, one rally did the three peaks of Yorkshire. Um, like there are people who will quite happily do that in a sort of, you know, 10 hour activity session. Um, there are others that sign up for that activity that really didn't do it in a 10 hour activity session and had to be collected and sort of mopped up. Um, pub crawls are often collected separately as well um, because there's been quite a lot of issues at past rallies with coaches where the pub crawl has ended up still in a pub and is, you know, they've just ordered drinks and they don't make it back to the coach. Um, and essentially uh, lots of rallies just pick them up separately because you don't hold everyone else up waiting for like five or six people that are hanging about in a pub. Um, big attractions often have their own personal coaches, um, but you're welcome to do sort of like anything weird that you want with activities and sort of, if you want activities that run at weird times and sort of start really early and sort of maybe leave before breakfast and get breakfast on the, co on the minibus to their activity, that is some things that have happened before. Um, so, um, I think I've probably spelled Kayla the wrong. Um, but yeah, some of these activities do sort of miss like the Kaylee, um, and some end up missing meals um, or sort of the set meal times. Um, but the goal is to keep some food behind for them unless you've explicitly told them if you're doing this activity, um, you will not be fed um, because you're getting back at a stupid time. And yeah. Um, I think the ones that did like the early hikes, they just gave people on that activity a Tupperware full of breakfast and sent them on a minibus and they ate Tupperware on the minibus. Um, outside of Saturday, um, you sort of have all kinds of things to do. This is sort of a great time for various themed stuff because you don't really have, unless your site is banged in the center of town, um, you probably don't have time to sort of get people off site on Friday or Sunday to go and do something. Um, but things like night hikes, pub quizzes, game shows, um, lots of rides have like very silly themed games. Um, chocolate Rally had a chocolatey obstacle course. Um, duck Rally had lots of like duck themed activities where you sort of 
did the taskmaster thing of knocking over ducks with various objects by throwing them at ducks. Um, crafts, on-site activities, campfire, Kaylee, you know, disco, sign disco. Um, there is a lot more demand in sort of recent feedback um, for sort of alternative evening activities. Lots of the current evening activities are things like, you know, the Kaylee, the disco, um, the campfire, which is sort of a lot more, I guess, extroverted social activities. Um, whereas there is a lot of sort of growing demand for sort of the alternate things at that time that are more, I guess, introverted or sort of more that you can do um, in a sort of more chill environment. Um, next slide, please. Um, thanks. Um, <laughs> so in terms of budgeting, before like any rally is allowed to spend money or any national event, they have to complete a budget. Um, so this is the sort of in-person budget for Green Rally, Yellow Rally. Um, so there is a set break-even point that you have to sort of cross through. Um, and then your main income comes from various participant fees. Um, you get some money for these late fees, um, but in the scale of things, not very much money. Um, the main purpose of these late fees is that you want to encourage people to book sort of two months before your event um, so that you know you know, you have a vague idea of how many people are coming because you don't want to sort of leave it till about a week before and then find out one club decides they're going to book all 30 of their members and bring a mini, two mini buses down, you know, a week before your event and you suddenly have to cater for 30 more people than you expected and all this kind of stuff. You want to sort of give that incentive to book early. Um, so... If you've noticed for this rally as well, we tried to give people free gifts for booking early for the similar sort of reasons. We wanted people to book so we knew how much to plan. Um, in terms of fundraising, so you'll notice that we aimed to raise zero. Um, that wasn't because we were aiming to not try, um, but because fundraising is extremely unpredictable. Um, Lots of the successes have been with sort of like local scout counties or guide counties, um, which are happy to give money for SEO events. But obviously for our event, um, that would have been sort of like the Milton Keynes area where none of us have particular connections to local scouting or guiding, which means it's quite hard to get in and then convince them to give us the money. Um, but I know like Roman Rally, where they have connections to those groups as a sort of bath group, they did succeed in getting various fundraising and discounts on county sites um, because of their sort of links. Um, so our sort of plan was that if we did succeed in getting any fundraising, um, we would just use that as essentially fund money um, in the sense that that would have gone straight into activities and we'd have just picked off activities that we wanted to run but couldn't afford and sort of thrown that money at them um, or sort of thrown it at extra food and things like that. Um, you can also seek donations from local companies. Um, again, we did try seeking donations for the online event, um, but again, it's really hard because lots of big companies direct you to, oh, the fundraising for is managed by the local stores, but you don't really have a local store for an online event. Um, and, you know, sort of approaching these local stores in Milton Keynes being like, you know, this has been organized a national event in Milton Keynes, it's taking place online, so we're not even visiting Milton Keynes. It was a very hard sell for sort of raising that. Um, again, indoor accommodation is not a compulsory feature of a rally site, but it is sort of, I, I would say, is very strongly encouraged in the sense that, you know, this is as well, like improving the accessibility of rallies um, and it is a sort of source of income for your, oh yeah, um, SUs are also fundraising. Um, again, as we're sort of not a club event, we also have difficulties with that one. But yeah, if you sort of uh, aim for those things, it can be quite a good source of money. Um, yeah, indoor accommodation um, sort of is a great additional source of income. Um, and if you look at our budget, it was sort of paying for about a third of our site at about break even. Um, nearly even a half. Um, it is. It is worth to point out how many, how much indoor accommodation we had at this yeah. site as well. So yeah, this site had a um, hundred and ten indoor beds and twenty hammocks. Um, 
which meant that we could probably offer them at five pounds a night, which is a bit cheaper than other um, rallies have. But again, like I think, I think Roman rally was ten pounds and for the weekend in indoor. Um, and my monitor is now going to switch off. Great. Um, yeah, so they were sort of ten pound, and they had about thirty. And I, I think, yeah, every single um, past rally that's had indoor accommodation has sold out of it. Um, but again, they've only had sort of like thirty or forty options. Um, we weren't so yeah, expecting there's also to, sort of, oh. yeah, we weren't expecting to sell out of the hundred and twenty yeah. uh, indoor accommodation either. So. Yeah, you might want to keep some some events, keep some behind for committee um, because the committee wants to just camp inside and stay warm. Um, again, that's something that events do and are welcome to do if they want to incentivize staff by saying you can stay indoors for free. Um, there are lots of options. Um, sort of badge and merchandise sales also make a lot of income if you can sort of, you know, come up with something that people want to buy. Um, so yeah, in terms of our costs, so for this rally, the campsite was really cheap, uh, £1,276. Most rallies end up spending sort of four to five pounds per person per night. Um, that's sort of the usual. Um, however, you can very much, you know, budget it because essentially if you're saving on marquee hire, then that's an extra sort of thousand, 1,500 that you can add into your site higher costs and sort of make those even higher. Um, there are lots of other things about, um, you know, sort of the um, hiring coaches, um, hiring minibuses for our event, all the minibuses we were using had no hire fee, but you just had to add fuel because they would have been scout ones. Um, so there was just a sort of fuel charge of like 95p or 85p a mile. Um, and some events hire Kaylee bands, which sort of tend to be three to 500 ish. Um, but again, if you can, so sometimes you can often find cheaper in universities. Um, and then things like costs. So, um, you have to spend, um, seven pounds per person on food. That is a sort of exec mandate. Um, that is a lot of money to spend on food. Um, so you sort of can afford to go for the sort of pre-chops and various savings. Um, it is another way that you can get fundraising. Um, getting donations of food tends to be a lot easier than getting donations of money. You know, things like supermarkets and uh, Warburton's have sponsored quite a lot of rallies. Um, they just, you know, give you bread. But, you know, it's bread that you don't have to buy. Um, it's also um, branded as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, then essentially things like incorporating money for activities into your budget, because while most activities sort of that cost money have an extra charge, um, you do have to offer quite a lot of free activities for people who only want to pay the 27 pounds. Um, however, nothing is really free in this world. Um, even a free activity, you have to get a coach probably into town to get to it. Um, there might be, you know, some spending on various bits um, so including some kind of subsidy for all activities tends to be how free activities are, you know, included. Um, so we had sort of a 70p per person subsidy uh, on activities, um, which, I mean, doesn't sound like a lot, um, but that sort of the coach and the minibus were accounted for elsewhere. So that's 70p a person to sort of spend on various little bits for activities like ingredients, you know, buying bags of flour is pretty cheap if you're doing stuff like that. Um, and then as well, we allocated sort of money for stretch goals, sort of quite a good way to uh, sort of deal with the tail end of your budgets. Um, because what you'll find is, uh, if you, especially if you've got a fixed price campsite, um, when you start making your budget towards the higher capacities, you'll just end up making a massive profit. Um, or surplus, shall I say. Um, surplus. So, yeah, the aim of these events is not to make a surplus. The aim is to sort of break even as close as possible. Um, so if towards the end of these numbers, you are getting quite high, um, you should probably think about what you'd spend that money on as a stretch goal if you reach that point. 
Um, you do also need to encompass a contingency. So um, the national rules say that's 5% um, of your total sort of planned costs needs to be a contingency. Um, and there is another 5%, which is not included in the budget, that natu National SAGO guarantees to you um, as a sort of bonus to cover those costs. Um, you know, there are lots of unexpected things that you will probably have to buy during the event that aren't on the budget. Um, so it? you might, you know, food prices could increase um, just between you making it. There could be any kind of stuff like that. Um, you might have to do a lot more miles, like, you know, if you, if you need to send a couple of people to hospital in a car and you have to reimburse that mileage, that can start adding up. Um, you might even have to sort of realize something is working and have to hire something in last minute. So for Duck Rally, we hired in lots of gas burners because we realized we weren't able to cook stuff fast enough. Um, so during dinner, we just hired in some from the scout group that we we're at. We just phoned them up and we're like, how much for these gas burners that you've got in this cupboard that I've got the key for? and sort of like hired those in. Um, but yeah, a sort of um, aim for things like this. Obviously the low end of this budget will make a massive loss because this is sort of like 25 people. And we're assuming at this point still that we're hiring the entire site for these 25 people will have a right of a weekend. Um, but we'll sort of, in reality at this stage, you'd probably cancel the whole site booking and maybe even cancel the sort of event if only 25 people were going, because that's probably just your club. Um, um, so yeah, the things that sort of tend to be hired in are various marquees, coaches, minibuses, uh, kitchen equipment, um, sort of serving tents. Uh, you might need additional tents if you're wanting sort of separate spaces from the marquee um, or like in a hall, because they tend to get quite busy and rowdy. Um, and not everyone is a fan of that. So having sort of the alternate spaces, the chill and quieter activities um, might mean hiring in extra things. Um, you might want to hire in things for disco, silent disco. Uh, lots of other rallies have hired in inflatables as well. I think it's fun, so I included it. Um, so yeah, um, oh, in terms of online stuff, you might also want to factor in hiring various platforms um, and stuff like that. Zoom is pretty expensive. Um, you know, things like Discord has to be paid for. Um, things like um, lots of the sort of online tools and escape rooms sort of have to come from somewhere. And some of those were paid for. So there's sort of lots of costs to the online events as well. Um, we do have a separate online budget template, which will also be going somewhere after this event, which sort of we use for the online bit. Um, so yeah, um, in terms of merch, um, lots of these things were very popular. I think we've now nearly sold out of everything uh, that we bought. So that's, I think, probably a first for a Sega event, not have anything left over. Um, we mostly stuck to flat items just due to the costs of postage. Um, but for in-person events, you know, you can get lots of, um, you know, customized things like mugs and pint glasses with things that we were looking at in person, but obviously they're not great to be posted. Um, and then essentially you want to price these for how many you think you'll sell at the minimum and um, sort of a good way to make money for fun things at your event. Um, sort of bars have been in and out of various rallies. Um, some events have them, you need lots of permission from the sites. Um, it does require a lot of budgeting to make sure that it breaks even because you have to buy lots of stock um, and then make sure that you can sell it. Um, but most rallies that have done it have made money. Um, I'm going to think five minutes left. So. Um, so the general points for running one of these events is as much effort as you put in, uh, there will always be people who are unhappy. I mean, it's sort of unfortunate, um, but it's just something that sort of I guess you have to deal with, there will always be complaints. Um, so try and keep um, your staff happy. They're the sort of people that are keeping your event running. Um, you know, if you find out, you know, you find too many staff and then you have to tell people, oh, sorry, you don't have to wash all these pots after dinner. I'm afraid you'll have to go to the Kaylee and enjoy yourself. They are not going to complain. Whereas if you tell them, 
sorry, you've washed two hours worth of pots, but we didn't find enough pot washers. Can you do another two hours? They will be really angry. Um, and sort of, you know, that's sort of, you need to keep these people motivated to sort of keep the event running. Um, and try and enjoy the event yourselves. Like, have a rotor between what your committee and make sure that you're assigned times to, um, you know, eat. That's important. Um, I've seen lots of rally committees that have forgotten to eat. Yeah, um, uh, I can't stress that enough before as well. I've been in events where, you know, you're on your feet for 15 hours a day. You know, I've catered for jamborees before. And uh, if anyone's been to Cam Jam and was on staff, I was part of the catering team there. We're on our feet from five o'clock in the morning till midnight uh, every day. And one year we literally had to do that with only four hours sleep every day. And so that was that was tough. Um, but yeah, you struggle to find the time to eat when you're washing 300 plates as well as all the other uh, catering equipment. So yeah, do find time to eat, do find time to, it might be worth if you have the space to allocate like a, a committee room or have a committee tent where it's exclusive use just for committees, like a hiding spot for you as well, uh, just so that you can get a five minute breather. Um, uh, yeah, so yeah, try and enjoy the event. You know, you probably won't be able to attend any of the activities, but you can sort mm. of, you know, lots of things like the care that you can get involved with. You can eat the food, like, again, crucial that you eat the food. Um, and also things like, um, well, I was sort of going to conclude with saying that insurance is very useful, as we found out <laughs> over the past year. Um, you know, it's sort of probably one of the first things that events will have to sort going forwards. Uh, and make sure that they're insured for various eventualities and sort of planned for various contingencies. I don't think um, a sort of national lockdown was ever on the contingency list for um, organising events before. Um, you know, we've had terrorism, we've had train strikes, um, flooding, all those things are on the standard contingency list that's been around years. Um, but I think national lockdown may be joining them uh soon so um we'll conclude on that cheery note um are there any questions <laughs>